Disclaimer! The following episode contains spoilers for What If Season 1. Don't go crying to your mum if we spoil it for you. You've been warned. Welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. And this week, I am the Meridew. I am your guide on this review of a TV show. It's not as grand when you say it like that. Ah, oh, who cares? We're talking about What If! Cue the music! Hello there, capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. My name's Scott James Meridu, and this is the show where we talk about various geek and nerd-related topics, and I'm joined each week by a very special different guest. The returning once again, he's become quite the mainstay on this show, it's Francisco Andrade! How you doing, Francisco? Really, really good. Excited to talk about the show. It's pretty great. Goddamn, yeah. I mean, I wasn't sure what this show was going to be like. It's going to like, are people going to like this? How are they going to do this? How Marvel's going to handle this? And it turned out really fucking well. People have their favorite episodes and things like that, but overall, reaction to this has been uniformly positive because this show, I feel, is a celebration of the last 10 plus years of Marvel movies yeah. and Marvel stories and all these characters that we've grown to love and since we were kids that a whole new generation has grown up with. It's a pure celebration of that as well as an opportunity to tell new and interesting stories. And we're going to talk about all of that in Butamo. Before we can do that, we're just going to dive right into the news. <laughs> Not a ton of news that I really want to talk about. I was wondering, like, should we even talk about the fact that they're planning a That 70s Show spin-off called That 90s Show? Do we even... Uh, does anyone even want to talk about that? I, or is that like... Because, I mean, on the one hand, Kurtwood Smith and Deborah Joe Rupp returning to look after uh, Donna and Eric's daughter. But on the other hand, Why? Why, why, why are we doing this? Are we that far from the '90s that we look upon it like we did the '70s when that nine, that '70s show first started? Are we at that? Are we old? Yeah, we are extremely old, and it's extremely scary. Also, do we? Do I'm we still in my twenties. What the fuck? <laughs> do we? Do we need this? Do we need? I think that's the biggest question: is do we need this? I oftentimes I think when re- shows get rebooted or get a new spinoff, I just think of. Jeff Goldblum. It's like you spend all this time thinking you could. Did you stop to think if you should? I was like, Jeff Goldblum, where's he going with this? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, the problem is the whole, whole idea is it's a new generation. They're going to have to deal with new problems. But the great thing about that 70s show was there was such a diverse cast. There was all these kid characters, all these adult characters, all dealing with things in different ways. This appears to be much more scaled down, and it's just going to be Kurt with Smith being grumpy for most of the time, which we've already seen to much better effect in that 70s show. So, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. As long as they don't make it go, like, three seasons longer than it should have done, like with that 70s show. They ran out of the 70s! But literally, like, the first couple of seasons... Like we, you could see on the little license plate at the end of each show that they would like one year of the seventies. Then the next season will be the next year of the seventies. But then the show got so popular they realized, oh shit, we're going to run out of the decade. So they had to sort of like pause it and make the years drag on for longer in some sort of like wibbly wobbly time paradox bullshit. And then fucking the main character left and they thought we can keep going right no they got fucking Seth Meyers brother in for some reason and no one cared. I didn't even want to talk about the show. Why are we talking about it? Moving on. I want to talk about something that I actually do want to talk about. They have released the opening title sequence for the upcoming animated show, The Legend of Vox Machina. Are you familiar with Critical Role, Francisco? Oh, I'm very familiar with Critical Role. (laughs) Good, because I'm, I'm sick of saying that to people and just getting blank stares from people. But yeah, this is the D&D show that got so insanely popular that it's been spawned numerous graphic novels, its its own D&D supplements, and also now a full animated feature, which is the dream for anyone who's ever played Dungeons & Dragons. Um, I'm playing Curse of Strahd right now, 
uh, with a place to hang your but Paul Capus's uh, editor Alex Mirabel DMing, and it's I uh, it's one of the most fun experiences I've ever had. It's it's so awesome. We deserve our own show. My character deserve a show. Hand me up. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Let's you can a, play the innkeeper. I don't know. Let's have a place to hang your cape D and D campaign going on. <laughs> well, we have sort of done that. We did the Christmas special, uh, which also featured Alex DMing, which was really cool. Uh, where I played Moonfly, the sort of what? What? He's not a tabaxi. He's a kangaroo dingo wolf <laughs> creature monk who was like. Hey man, I'm Moonfly. I'm like, hey, it's all good, man. Until he starts <laughs> punching people, and that was a lot of fun. Maybe we'll do more things like that. Who knows? <laughs> there's just say, there's so many. There's so many people doing D and D shows now on YouTube. Uh, even like everyone's got one now these days. The, so I guess where's the harm in just one more? Uh, Mangello, Joe Mangello, who plays Deathstroke in the DCU, he's a huge D and D fan, and he talks about it. Yeah, I I he love. T- I love that like these big stars are coming forward and like normalizing D and D because ten years yeah. ago even people were like, "Oh my god, you play D and D? What are you doing?" And now it's like this is why I never played it until I was a fully grown adult because I just didn't have access to it. But now it's like so big. You know, Stranger Things had that it had a huge part of their mm-hmm. show. All their villains are named after D and D villains, and I think that's incredible. And now we have all these big stars, and also, but nobody's doing it better than Scott Mercer, who's doing Critical Role. He's you mean Matt Mercer? Matt Mercer, yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> you you, confused, said you were so amazed by my D and D brilliance yes. that you confused, amalgamated the two of us. Although you I would be too powerful. You can't combine with him. <laughs> Together, we could rule the world. <laughs> oh, but I mean. Legend of Vox Machina, basically, it is a story based on the beginning of that campaign that they did uh, featuring Kilif the Druid, Grog Strongor, Strongjaw, the Goliath Barbarian, Pike Trickfook, the Gnome Cleric, Scanlan Shorthold, the Gnome Bard, Percy, the Human Gunslinger. Yeah, this is a fantasy world where one guy has a bunch of guns. Check that out. Vaxeldan and... Vexalia, I've nearly forgotten her name. I, I know her full name, Vex, well, a short name, Vex. I forgot her full name, Vexalia. The uh, half elf rogue and the half elf ranger, respectively. The two twins. Have I left anyone out? Um, I don't believe so. I'm, I'm 99% sure I've left someone out. Who have I? Who have I always? I always forget one of them. I always forget one of them. What's the what's wrong with me? Uh, I'm going to check this because I want to make sure. <laughs> I'm looking it up now, just to be safe. Uh, did you say? No, I got them all. Oh, I know who I forgot. Trinket the bear. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's who I was forgetting. <laughs> the Vex's pet bear. Uh, basically, they're an adventuring party that go on adventures all over the continent of Taldori, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I- I'm more familiar with the second campaign they did with all new characters, but... Yeah, it's it's such a great story because it's told by such a great storyteller, Matthew Mercer, and all these other great storytellers, all these great voice actors who are going to play, all these great characters. And I'm super excited for it because this is a culmination. We've talked about this on the show before. The culmination of one of the most successful Kickstarters in the history of Kickstarters, where they got $3 million over the uh, over a day. It's incredible. It's out- oh, my God. And 11 million at the end of 45 days. There's this thing that the fans of the show, us to include it, are called critters, short for critical role. And there's a thing that's described called the critter hug of death, where critters will just flock to this one thing, overwhelm that website servers, and cause it to crash. And, and, then, and I want to. Br- I bring this up because it's go. It's debuting on Amazon Prime uh, the beginning of next year, and studios turned this down. They said, "Ooh, we don't really want to take a chance on that." Back when they were only asking for like one special, one animated special that would cost like seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which sounds like a lot, but it's really cheap as chips when it comes to you know prime time animation. And they said no. And they're all kicking themselves because look how much money people were just willing to just give them. They, we talked about, uh, we were, well, before the show started, we were talking about brand recognition briefly uh, regarding like uh, the more recent Hellboy movie and how that failed because they just relied on brand recognition. This is an instance where brand recognition 
like they just sort of passes people by and they don't even realize it. It's a true testament to how corporations and film companies just really, really don't get it some of the time and they lose out big time. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because it's so cool. I mean, the, the animation is beautiful. It's the same animation. Uh, it's Titmouse animation. He's done all sorts of great stuff. And it was the same uh, uh, character designer and background artist who worked on things like Young Justice, similar character designs for that. It's it's really, really cool. If you, watch a lot of their, if you go onto their YouTube channel, watch all of their behind the scenes uh, videos it's really informative and really cool they're very open about their process especially now with covid and so it's really really cool another animation i want to bring up that i've seen a trailer for and i was completely unaware of this apparently this has been around for a little while uh a trailer for the upcoming blade runner black lotus have you seen this oh yeah <laughs> i'm a very excited i'm a big big blade runner fan yeah, and uh, I really liked the original Blade Runner, and I really liked the sequel, Blade Runner 2049. Surprisingly good movie. I was not expecting it to be good at all, but it was actually quite good. And then uh, we've got this. I don't know a lot about the story, but the animation looks really cool. It's going to be on uh, Cartoon Network's Adult Swim. And I, it looks it looks so dripping with noir, to the point where it's actually kind of difficult to determine what the actual story is. But then it's Blade Runner, so it's about, oh my god, what does it mean to be human? Which doesn't mean it's going to be a bad story at all. It's just that's the only story Blade Runner's ever had. So Yeah, but it's, well, uh, it's set uh, 17, I think 17 years before the original. Oh, not, not the okay. original before 2049. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a okay. quite a bit. So it's in between. It's a midquill. Exactly. Okay. Well, that that will be very interesting to look at and to see. And will they get Harris support in? No, of course not. He's like, <laughs> I'll turn it for I'll turn it for one movie to go back to something that may be popular, and then I'm done. Okay, you, I'm done once, and maybe another cameo in the third one just to make it slightly less shit. I I am enjoying that uh, production companies and movies are actually having more fun with actually releasing animated movies in between. Because I I think mm. that that. I don't know. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. I recently saw the The Witcher, the oh yes, movie, and that was I thought that was outstanding. <laughs> it was it was one of those things where I liked it while I was watching it, and when I look back and I thought, okay, that was good, but it wasn't as good as it could have been. Some people have been very critical of it. I personally think it is quite good. It's um, it's set a long time before the events of the TV show, the books, and the video games. Can I just say? Fuck, I'm, I'm replaying Witcher 3 right now, and the, the whole canon is fucked. Everything is just, like, I, I am, I, I've actually, I haven't read the books, I've ordered them from Amazon, because I also started, um, I actually didn't finish watching the Witcher TV show, not the original live action one, the original Polish language version, which apparently is shit, the uh, Netflix one with Henry, no, seriously, I have Range Cavill, and <laughs> <laughs> I actually an actor i'm just saying he's not had great casting choices but anyway uh and it's just it's very difficult to piece everything together considering the fact there's multiple uh not timelines but multiple concurrent plot lines and different canons and the video game started with him like losing all of his fucking memories and i didn't even get to play the first two games because they're all on pc and i am a filthy console peasant <laughs> It's a whole thing. But on the animated Nightmare of the Wolf, it felt like it was like very one very short story stretched out to an hour and a half. And I think that's why I didn't like it as much as I could have done. And, and it's the character of Vesemir, who's like the mentor of Geralt of Rivia. And he's so young and he's so completely different from his character that, you, as we know from the books and the show, where he's going to be turning up in the second season and the video games, that he might as well just be a completely different named character. Like, no, this isn't Vesemir. This is Bob the Witcher. <laughs> Hello, Bob. He doesn't even have the mustache. I'm just saying. But that's a great example, actually, of all these different animations. And, and this is, I think we can actually look to DC in many ways for giving us just a glut of so many middling to actually pretty good animated movies, showing that you can just make these one-off movies uh, for relatively cheaply, get a bunch of pretty good voice actors or celebrities who actually know what they're doing when it comes to voice acting. I'm going to bring that up later. And uh, you can make a perfectly decent, watchable movie that people will watch once and never really return to again. But they don't have to because it's just 
fun. And that's what we're going to do. Although with Blade Runner Black Lotus, I feel like they're trying to add an extra level of artsiness to it. Because otherwise Ridley Scott will just complain about it. Not that anyone cares what Ridley Scott thinks. <laughs> why, why haven't you retired, Ridley Scott? I just... Why? Yeah. Anyway, moving on. I mentioned voice acting. Updates slightly on the controversial Mario movie casting. I say update because... This isn't really something that Nintendo or the studios or anything like or the actors have put out. This is merely just a well, something I've observed from the reaction to um, the initial casting. Because the reaction to the casting, when it was re- that revealed that Chris Pratt was going to be Mario, Keegan Michael Key was going to be Toad and all of these, was completely and unanimously... Ooh, you suck! But now I've recently noticed... A change. I'm seeing something different happen in the infosphere. It appears that actually people are warming up to a lot of these cast. Uh, Jack Black, people are saying, okay, like I know it's weird, but you know what? He's good at voice acting. We've seen the Kung Fu Panda. He could be a good Bowser. King of Michael Key is like, okay, um, I think he might be quite a good uh, Toad. Seth Rogen is Donkey Kong. You could do worse. No I one is saying that about Chris Pratt. Charlie no Day is Luigi, though. That's yeah. That's the dream. <laughs> I, I actually think so that could that fun. also could work. And this is the thing. See, Chris Pratt, he's not a bad actor. He's not even a bad voice actor. We all saw in the Lego movie. He's fine in that. He can only do that one character as far as voice acting is concerned. But that's beside the point. What I will say this, whether or not this is good in terms of the voice acting is going to be 100% dependent on the voice direction given. Because I've got a horrible feeling that Keegan-Michael Key is going to stroll into the studio and he's going to say, right guys, I've got a whole bunch of ideas for how you want this Toad voice. i got like different accents, different styles. I've been looking at all the video games, the different voice actors that come before me. And my biggest fear is I'm going to turn around to him and say, no, 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 Keegan, just do your usual voice. Just do your normal voice. And he'll be really disappointed, but he'll do it anyway. And that's what's going to happen. And it's just going to be Toad, where it's just like fucking Keegan Michael Key's voice. And it's going to sound really fucking weird. But if they let him be a fucking actor, a pretty good actor that he is, uh, the same with Jack Black, the same with Seth Rogen and Charlie Day, although Charlie Day's less uh, necessary for that, it's going to turn out well. Chris Pratt could not be anything other than just Chris Pratt coming out of Mario's body. It's it's not going to work. That's not his fault. Like, I, I, I don't want anyone to think that like, I'm picking on Chris Pratt or bullying Chris Pratt or thing. I think that Chris Pratt is a bad actor because he's not. He's just not. He's a very good actor. But Danny DeVito is a good actor. I would not cast him for the fourth season of The Crown to play Queen Elizabeth. You know? Like... Like, I, I, I don't with be... Scott on this. Cast Danny DeVito in the fourth season of The Crown. No, no, because no, <laughs> like, he would do a very good job, but he doesn't <laughs> fucking, he's not the fucking queen. You can't do that. Okay, doesn't matter. This is the same sort of thinking that led to fucking Scarlett Johansson playing, playing all these controversial roles. It's less, con- it's even a little bit controversial because Mario is a very much Italian character, and I'm pretty sure they won't be resorting to stereotypes in the movie itself. But Chris Pratt is unambiguously, ubiquitously not Italian. But is he Mario? I hear rumors that people want Frank Grillo to play the role. Just saying. Oh, Frank Grillo would actually be great. I I just think that if Mario doesn't say at least one Mamma Mia, what are we even here for? It's just like, Mamma Mia, oh my. (laughs) Here we go. Like that that's how it's gonna sound. It just sounds wrong. It sounds a little bit wrong. <laughs> I am Meanwhile, I, am so... I can in my mind I can perfectly hear Luigi Day go like Mario Like <laughs> It it could be a pleasant surprise. It could be like you know, the Sonic movie wasn't as travesty as people thought it was gonna be. Yes! I brought this up before because fucking Ben Schwartz sounds like Sonic always has. Sonic always has just had that sort of normal grounded voice. Unless he's in like a PSA or something like, remember kids, if someone tries to touch you in a spot that you don't like, that's no good. (laughs) Like, I'm not even joking about that. That's a real thing Sonic once said. (laughs) Jaleel White, what has become of you? Anyway, (laughs) uh, that's my piece. Uh, That's my piece on that. That's not really news. That's just something I've noticed happening. Like the, the, the tide has turned somewhat, except for Chris Pratt. He's still pretty fucking wet. 
On to the last bit of news that I want to do now. Um, this is a bit weird, a bit out of left field, but I wanted to bring it up because it's somewhat related to me tangentially. Um, Rockstar, Rockstar Games have announced that they are going to be releasing a compilation, possibly remastered, possibly remade, don't quite know yet, um, version of GTA 3, Vice City, and San Andreas. And this has prompted a big cry of, Cool, because these are the games that made GTA, and everyone's really excited about that. It's a huge milestone in the gaming industry. However, Rockstar, in keeping with current trends, have decided to be dicks about it, because they then said, furthermore, next week, or whatever it is, we're going to be removing all current versions of those games from digital sale retailers. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because I live in Edinburgh, a place where Rockstar got started. Their headquarters are like a 10, 15 minute walk away from where I live. And they are, what's the most extreme word I could use? Cunts. Like, I know that's an extreme word. I know that's what people are going to like that word, but they are just utter bastards. Let's list a few choice examples. One, they don't pay their fucking tax in this country. They take... Uh, grants that are meant for like small independent UK video game companies for tax relief and they use them to not pay tax even though they earn fucking billions of dollars a year and not even that they don't pay tax it's that they take away these grants from other companies that need them motherfucking lying bastards two there are modders out there huge community modders who work to make these games, these older games especially, not only a bit more fun, a bit more, a bit wackier, but also playable and add in much needed fixes and patches and quality of life enhancements that Rockstar themselves refuse to do because they much rather monetize the latest free DLC for fucking GTA 5 Online. And, they, and Rockstar routinely uh, try and take down their mods and harass them and bully them. And a third, and I've already brought this up, but I'm going to bring it one more time, the fucking microtransactions, the never-ending assault of soulless, corporate, money-grubbing, greedy, uh, addiction-creating microtransactions make them... I mean, they're like the UK's EA at this point. There, I said it. Harsh words, I know, but there. I think that might actually be a bit more controversial than the C word, but still... And this is just I, this is just the latest. And I'm not a huge GTA guy. I've played online and GTA Five, and I like those games fine. But I also like Rockstar for uh, Red Dead Redemption games and a couple of other games that they make. And I used to look up from them. There was at one point where I wanted to work for them. I never got that opportunity, but now fucking couldn't pay me enough money. It's that they are evil bastards and this example is just uh, the latest example and i bring this up is because people say oh well if you've already got the game it should be fine there's been issues with that before on steam store and things like that so it's just like why do you hate your own community so much rockstar is it was it not enough that you make so much money out of them that you feel like you can't pay any money back to the country you live in or is it is it the fact that so many people are making um, graphical improvements that are actually a bit better than the mainstream vanilla games that you put out yourself for being a billion dollar company? So, fuck you, Rockstar. Fuck you. And on that cheerful note, here are some ads! And now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. I need something happy to distract me from Rockstar. Ooh, what's this? What if? <laughs> it's <laughs> this show is fucking great. It's it's so good, and I and I missed you know the, to go a little bit ahead, but I missed the fact that there's shows out there now that just kind of do everything episodic, and there's a big storyline, mm. and I like that you can take this one at a time, you know. Without, you know, considering the last two episodes, but like you can just take this one one at a time and you can watch out of order if you really want to. And it's just a fun experience and it's fun in different ways every episode. And I had a great time. 
It's stress-free binging, if anything. You're not even binging. You don't have to binge it. It's great. And we have to really, first of all, go back to the beginning, the origins of the show, which take place in the comics. I don't remember if DC did Elseworlds first or Marvel did What If first, but basically, What If is Marvel's Elseworlds. And it's all based around a question, what if something that happened didn't actually happen? Or what if something that did happen actually happened? And this is something that's been going on for a long, long time. Just fun, one-shot ideas that purely express the creativity of Marvel. And this show continues that exact same mindset, and it works really well. Although I will say the original comics didn't, as far as I'm aware, have the Watcher looking over them. The Watcher is not meant to guard over the multiverse. He's just meant to guard over parts of space, mainly Earth. I am sworn never to interfere. Oh yeah, then why do you do it all the fucking time? Yeah, I, like I don't. It's not just one hand; it's all of our hands that we can count on. The number of times you've interfered. How do you still have a job, Iwatu? <laughs> and I and I I really enjoyed the, their take on the Watcher in this one because in the comics, for those who are not very familiar, in the comics, he's more like a comic guide. He's like talking about the past adventures, and he's. Like, not really a narrator. He's just more like the voice in the sky type thing. And in this, he actually becomes the narrator. I like how he embodies the TV show in that aspect. Like, he kind of knows he's in a TV show, and so he embodies that. And it's- he's, like, he's like Rod Serling if he just kept on talking throughout the whole thing. Uh, but not in an, an obtrusive or annoying or distracting way. It's just like Rod Sterling, just like, uh-oh, that's going to turn out badly for them. I definitely think if Rod Sterling was alive, he would have been the watcher in this show. Oh, yes. But I can't, I can't, I'm just trying to like, how did Rod Sterling talk? But I can't, was it Rod Sterling or Rod Serling? I can never remember. Sterling. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take it. Take your word from that. <laughs> I think. I, I'm a know, big fan of Twilight Zone, so I hope I'm getting it right. But I speaking of that, Jeffrey Wright, who voiced the Watcher, great job! My God, he was kidding. Oh God, yeah. I'm not a huge Jeffrey Wright fan. I think he's a little bit overcast in some things, and he just kind of doesn't really leave an impact on me. He was fucking fantastic in this. Like, yeah, was- I, I, I'm not saying he's a bad actor by any stretch of the imagination. He's in lots of good films, made given lots of good performances. But as, when it's like in things like Westworld, I don't care. But it isn't something like this where he can be a bit creative and a bit fun and has a multidimensional character that's a little bit down to earth, but also has this. You get the sense that the same as in the comics that humans have rubbed off on the Watcher a little bit. He's picked up some bad habits, so to speak, and. Uh, I'm constantly conflicted whether or not to call him the Watcher or his actual name, Uatu. But Uatu is kind of silly, so let's go with the Watcher. Uh, and he's he's it's really really cool just to see this character. Not only and what I love about what I take from the comics is not only just to observe events, but he also comments on them. And there are times when he actually is quite sad about how things are going on. It's just like something bad is happening. I want to help. I don't want to sit here. I don't want to talk about this, but I can't. I can't do anything. And that is my curse just to watch. And when you understand the uh, background of the Watchers in the comics, it makes perfect sense because like the very first creatures they observed, they saw, oh, they're struggling. Let's give them technology. And those very same creatures blew themselves up with that technology. So so they were just like, yeah, okay, we're going to have to make a policy of non-interference, okay? We're just going to have to back the fuck away. <laughs> and that's the real tragedy of them as people and the real tragedy of The Watcher. And I'm so glad they kept that in because there's lots of different stories being told here. Some of them are fun. Some of them are silly. Some of them are serious. Some of them are fucking dark. And we're going to talk about them all right now. Let's start with episode one. What if Captain Carter were the first Avenger? This is all predicated on the idea that Steve Rogers didn't actually get the Super Soldier Serum, but actually Peggy Carter did. And I am here for this! Oh my god, this was the most exciting. Captain Britain, which... Terrible. There's already a Captain Britain, so we can't call her Captain Britain. We have to call her Captain Carter. Because I guess the United Kingdom is slightly less about the country national branding deal. <laughs> I I really enjoyed it, and I love the... Is it the same voice? It, it is the same voice actors that played her in the movies, right? Or no? Okay, so here's the thing. There are a lot of character voice actors from uh, Marvel coming over to the show, and lots of ones that aren't. Let's just actually go through some of the big ones now. 
Uh, Hayley Atwell, Sebastian Stan, Dominic Cooper, Stanley Tucci, Toby Jones. Um, they're all um, they're all returning. Chadwick Boseman uh, in his last appearance. Chadwick Boseman, yes, in his last appearance. Uh, Samuel Jackson returns. Uh, Ross Marquand, I think he did the work for... Yes, he did the Red Skull in Infinity War and Endgame. So he is technically a returning character. Frank Grillo uh, comes back a few times. Frank Grillo, Jeremy Renner, Michael Rooker, Josh Brolin, Benicio Del Toro, Kurt Russell, <gasps> Carrie Coon, Carrie Gillan, Damon Honsu, Sean Gunn, Seth Green, Danny Guerrero, uh, Fred Tassori, uh, no, 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 not really, but kind of. Uh, Mark Ruffalo, Tom Hiddleston, Clark Gregg, Jamie Alexander, <gasps> Michael Douglas, Benedict Cumberbatch, Ray Pittman Adams, Benedict Wan, Tilda Swinton, Leslie Bibb, Paul Beckley, Evangeline Lilly, Paul Rudd, John Favreau, Emily Van Camp, David Dast Malchian, uh, Michael B. Jordan, Angela Bassett, Andy Serkis, Don Cheadle, Chris Hemsworth, Natalie Portman, Kat Dennings, Jeff Goldblum, Colby Smulders, <gasps> Clancy Brown! And there's a whole bunch of other actors that we really don't have the time to go through who would uh, voice characters for people who haven't turned up, such as uh, Tony Stark or Steve Rogers, people like that. So not everyone's returning, but I imagine everyone who could return did, and it's great. And you know what? A lot of times, you can't tell. Lake Bell voices um, uh, Black Widow for it's, reasons. It's crazy. I. It sounds. Ex- she sounds exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, she's. Uh, she's a pretty good voice actor, Lay Bell. I like her in a lot of stuff, and uh, she's a great, great job filling in for Scarlett Johansson, who I guess needed a bit of distance. <laughs> um, we're not going to get into that anyway. So uh, you might think, oh, not too much would change with uh, Captain Carter becoming. Uh, the Captain America instead, actually, no, because uh, she a whole bunch of different things happens. She basically creates sort of, instead of the Howling Commandos, sort of a prototype Invaders, Squadron Supreme type thing with, well, mainly herself and Steve Rogers, skinny Steve Rogers, as he's known as, uh, taking the role of the Hydra Stomper in a prototype Iron Man suit made by Howard Stark. This is so cool. This is this episode is a great starter because it showcases immediately what the show is going to be about. It shows how creative they can get, how different things can be, and how they can explore all these different things. They could have played it safe, but they hit you hard with all the differences pretty goddamn quickly and i'm not gonna lie seeing captain carter whip about with the fucking union jack on her shield (laughs) is fucking amazing rule britannia with marmalade and jam she's so good and i i think that her role is just she's so much more confident than steve was ever because she's already you know incredibly Mm. powerful beforehand she had title she had rank and she wasn't really respected because of the time and because of the fact that she was a woman. But then she becomes the superhero and she immediately just takes to it in a way that Steve took a little bit to kind of embrace. She just immediately becomes... Because he was, he was less assertive, so he got press ganged into like the USO shows and stuff like that. She, She's not having none of that no, because she, she can't afford to. She just and I, I, no I, shit. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I, I think that's partly because of her character, partly because Britain had been in the shit for the war much longer than America had. So they're like, we can't fuck around with this thing. Though, she, though her superiors do take some convincing, her uh, commanding officer voiced by Bradley Whitford, who's just in this, just because they could get Bradley Whitford. I'm okay with that. Love me some Bradley Whitford. Um, it takes some convincing and... There's a whole bunch of... I almost don't want to go into the full episode spoilers just because I want people to appreciate... Um, the ways this thing goes. So we're going to give very broad overviews of a lot of things. What I love about it, though, is that the relationship between, uh, uh, I need to say Sharon, no, uh, Peggy and Steve still has room to grow. And if anything, they get on a little bit better because he is, Steve is the epitome of anti-toxic masculinity. He does not care that even before she got the super soldier serum, this woman could kick his ass. He just likes her for her. And it's so sweet. And I, and I love how supportive he is after she gets it. Like she, yeah. there's a scene where she feels a little guilty that she got it and he did it. And he just squashes that. He's like, no, you deserve this. Like, this is all you. And 
I, I love that relationship between them, that it shows that, like, regardless, they were just going to be there for each other, like they were in the original, like how they are in the what if. And I shipped them 100%. Yes, Steve, I'm glad you went back in time and stayed with her after Endgame. <laughs> you know what I want? Fuck that 90s show. I want a sitcom a la WandaVision with these two growing old together in the past after Endgame. Just Although- Steve trying to avoid spoiling history. <laughs> Oh god! Yeah, that, actually, I think there has been a warp zone sketch based around that premise, so I think that's pretty much killed it. But still, <laughs> they dance at the end. <laughs> we all meet again. I, I can't even. And it's so cool. And also, we have to talk about the animation. The animation is fucking phenomenal. I love this style of animation. It reminds me of very much of the style of animation used for the MTV Spider-Man cartoon. I don't know if you remember that. Yes. I totally agree. It's like that, but improved and refined and a bit more stylistic. It's really, really cool because all the animation looks just like the characters, almost like they're rotoscoped. It's very scanner darkly, but it it avoids, in my mind, the uncanny valley for the most part. There are some characters that just look a little bit weird. It's the eyes. Some people just have slightly smaller eyes than other people, and that doesn't transfer well to animation, because animation, you need bigger eyes in order to convey expressions better. And that's not really a big problem in this episode, but later on, it's just like, why are your eyes so tiny? Why? I don't like it. Anyway, and so... (laughs) Uh, this episode culminates in uh, the Red Skull doing a bunch of experiments and opening a portal using the Tesseract. And then a fucking Shoggoth tries to come out of it. Ah, I love that. <laughs> I, I love the, the, the Hellboy reference, which that's what I'm calling it. And the total... The... Why are we bring up Hellboy so much today? I don't know. It, it's always a good time to bring up Hellboy. Yeah. But but I, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy that it's a different threat. I enjoy that it's, you know... Because the Hydra Stumper was powered by the Tesseract. Uh, Howard mm. Stark, because uh, Captain Carter, proving that she was a much more assertive uh, than Captain America, immediately stole back the Tesseract and didn't take her a whole movie. She did it in like 20 minutes flat. And then they managed to power. Steve's busy doing like doodles in his notebook. She's out kicking Nazi ass. <laughs> so they managed to steal it. They obviously get it stolen back, and he opens a portal in her reality. And it's it's great, and her sacrifice and the, the things that she does, I I think that it represented Captain Carter extremely well in this episode. And unfortunately, though, it did leave me a bit of taste in my mouth when I remember that we only got two seasons of Agent Carter. She just give her her own movie. Fuck Black Widow, give her a movie. Uh, but uh, that's anyway. I I wonder. I don't. I doubt they were able to record together. But it's so cool to see her. And uh, Neil McDonough and also uh, Dominic Cooper it, playing these characters together because they had great chemistry. They worked well together. He turned up. He clearly had really good, you know, personal relationship because he turned up for the TV show as well. So it, it, it's great to see these characters together because we kind of like them because they're the characters we sort of left behind in a way. Mm, sad. Moving on to episode two. What if T'Challa became Star Lord? This is a little bit silly. And honestly, I think you could probably cut this episode out if it weren't for the fact that it's just a pure celebration of Chadwick Boseman. And frankly, that's that makes it one of my favorites. It's 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 the base the whole idea is what if, you know, Chris Pratt didn't get abducted by Michael Rooker, instead it was Chadwick Boseman for no reason other than just shits and giggles turns out a lot change Thanos is now a good guy <laughs> because of the power of talking really well Chadwick Boseman just convinces him to stop being bad and I adore that premise because they never really expand upon it it's just oh I convinced them he didn't have to kill everybody and they're like oh okay cool <laughs> and Nebula is <laughs> she's hot Wait, what's the new- she, Nebula's got like full femme fatale blonde ringlets and uh, what did she call Star-Lord? Cha-Cha? Yeah. She, she, calls, she calls Black Panther Cha-Cha. It's so cool. And <laughs> yeah, they got Josh Brolin back. Arguably one of the biggest supervillain characters in the last couple of decades. 
And he's just been like uh, hanging around in bars, just being like, yeah, I was a little bit grumpy back then. <laughs> just, just I, I love that he keeps trying to, uh, one of the running jokes of the episode is that he keeps trying to talk why the genocide really wasn't that bad because it was random. He just, no, no, it's random, so it's fine. And like, it's okay. Yeah, it's half, but it's effective. <laughs> and you know he comes across like that one guy who took one social studies course too many and thinks he knows how to you know fix democracy like that it's just like no it's only a slight bit of eugenics it's only a little bit of ethnic cleansing it's really weird but it's also kind of funny and it really shouldn't be but also they don't explain exactly how he became good like T'Challa talked him down but that's it. No further explanation. The Mad Titan's just like a slightly estranged dad dude bro now. <laughs> and we just have to live with that. This is a weird universe. But on the one hand, we do get to see more of Howard the Duck. Oh my god. It's Seth Green coming back. Howard the Duck. Amazing. And <sighs> so funny. Fucking love me some Howard the Duck. Well, I say I love me some Howard the Duck. I love me some Howard the Duck when they know that it's silly. Exactly. Like, he's just, there is a joke. I'm looking at you, George Lucas movie. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Tim Robbins is like, I'm a master of quack fool. You're, you're a master of shit. I, I say that, I've got the poster for it right here. Oh just, just to spite myself and remind myself that there is no hope for this world. But <laughs> <laughs> and this is it's just full of Guardians of the Galaxy's characters are having a good time. There's a heist thing going on with um the, the, uh, the collector. I'm I refuse to call him by his actual name. He's the collector. Come on, come on. Benito de Toro, you're the collector. And he's and, and ripped he's, for some reason. He's jacked. Apparently he was lifting, you know, he was working shake weights or something. Because maybe. For some reason, in th this was like a big discussion, is why is Benicio Del Toro's re uh, collector in this universe have a 12-pack? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Here's the thing. We, do, we don't really question those kind of things because it's just part of the fun. And the fun even continues when it's revealed where T'Challa came from and how the Wakandans actually sends like spacecraft out to try and get him back and how he eventually does reunite with his family and then takes with him like his adopted family all the different guardian characters over to Wakanda and it's a really good time and you think wow so the last episode was kind of serious but this one is just fun from start to finish then it ends with Ego the Living Planet tracking down Peter Quill on Earth saying that he's his father and it leaves you with the ominous notion that this Earth may what soon be done for. Yeah. And then you remember, oh, this show's actually quite good. This show's actually really clever. And it, it takes full advantage of all of these ideas, all these situations. They completely use every single plot thread that they can think of to tell the best story. Which brings me to something that I didn't actually it coming with one of these stories the next episode what if the world lost its mightiest heroes this is a whole thing where basically all the avengers are getting killed off before they could become avengers this is fucking genius because it's a murder mystery with the avengers it's clear with tony stark even though he's only in it for about two seconds. <laughs> yeah, because it takes starts off circa Iron Man 2, uh, even though I'm not pretty sure that doesn't fit well with the timeline. No, we'll it, see it, later. So Iron Man 2, Thor, and Hulk all happened in the same week of, like, in-universe. Oh, shit, you're right. Yeah, so they all uh, happened in the same week in-universe. So uh, I think in the, in the lore, it's called... Uh, Fury's big week, and in this episode, it's Fury's <laughs> bad week. <laughs> oh, because he's like he's having the donut scene with uh, Tony Stark, and then they give him like a shot, like that'll take care of your little blood poisoning thing. Then he fucking dies. What's going on here? They track down. Uh, did they get um, what's her face, Liv Tyler, to? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, it is. I believe. Like, I'm looking at the cast. This is so fucking huge. Does she? Does she, I don't think they have. She has any lines, does she? No, she does. She she played her character, um, oh, Betty right. Ross. Well, uh, I think she did. If she actually turned up, is she in this fucking movie? Did we mention her earlier? I don't think so. I don't Let's think double check. Uh, da, 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 da. No, no, she didn't. No, it's completely different. I, I should have recognized the fact that her voice is in like, uh, hi, I'm Evangeline. Uh, no, not Evangeline. <laughs> I, I'm Liv Tyler. I don't know how she talks. It's that, the weird way she talks. Unless she's playing Arwen, in which case she talks fucking normally. Like, she's like, if you want him, come and claim him. And the rest of the time she's like, hi, I'm Liv Tyler. That, she, that sounds more like Michael Jackson. I'm sorry. That's not fair, but... <laughs> I, I enjoyed that part of the episode a lot because they finally mentioned that the Incredible Hulk is actually part of the MCU again. Like, can we talk about that? <laughs> I fucking, I like that movie. So I've always wanted it to be canon and now they've officially declared canon, especially considering the fact that Robert Downey Jr. is in it and the characters from that movie do keep on turning up. They keep on giving fucking William Hurt a job, so yeah. might as well declare it canon. Okay, but now we get to see the perspective of that movie with Mark Ruffalo. Which is fantastic. And, and I've always found it weird that Thunderbolt Ross keeps going to meetings with Mark Ruffalo there, one of the Avengers, and he never brings up the fact that Mark Ruffalo is like his biggest hate in the world. Like, yeah. Thunderbolt Ross hates the Hulk. He hates Bruce Banner. So why? That's, never, that's a really good point, actually. That's <laughs> never come up. He keeps going to meetings and seeing everybody, and he never goes, hey, you're the guy that slept with my daughter. Screw you. <laughs> Or even just like, hey, so I don't like you because you gave a job to the guy that fucking is a monster. What? Who? Who? <laughs> Big green guy. I don't know. Anyway. Um, is he dumping the show? I don't know. And um, yeah, so uh, Bruce Banner gets fucking, as the Hulk, gets fucking blown up in a, what appears to be kind of silly, but then turns quite a gruesome way. Um Clem Barton accidentally, without meaning to, kills Thor, a depowered Thor, who he then later on dies in custody. And it's like all these people are dying somewhat. And what I love about it is it's a murder mystery, but it's one where you could figure it out if you understood, if you watched all of these movies and you understood all of these characters. I didn't figure it out nearly as quick as I would have liked to, but I figured it out right before the second to last one. I was sort of like, Okay, I think I know who it is. I'm just not sure why. And it's revealed to be Hank Pym. Yeah, people make fun of Ant Man all this time for like, oh, he's so silly. Fuck you. Ant Man apparently could kill anyone he wants to because Hank, admittedly in the yellow jacket suit, does exactly that. Basically, in this version, he lost both his wife and his daughter. I guess got exposed to one too many pimp articles, went all fucked up in the head, and killed all the Avengers to spite Nick Fury. Nick Fury, however, teams up with Loki, who's there to avenge his brother, and managed to defeat him. Only this culminates in Loki trying to take over the Earth. And I, for one, welcome our new insect overlords. Wouldn't call them insects, but still. It, it, and it's just, there's so many twists and turns, and I just I am a I am an absolute slut for whodunits. It, it, it's my biggest weakness. I I love that sort of figuring out. And Black Widow is the one doing the figure out for lots of it, and it's just so cool and so interesting. And it makes perfect sense given the context they set up. I feel like they could have dropped hints about it earlier in the show, like maybe a newspaper article of like. Uh, Hope and Janet Van Dyne are dead or something like that. Just just something in the background, something small so people can piece it together. But maybe that'd be too obvious. What do you think? No, I I, I liked it. I, I think that it was... I don't know. The methods of death, I think, have a lot to do with it too. Because, like, who else could have done this? And in the way that it was done. Especially because, like, who could have... Because Barton even says that he just he didn't realize that he released or something like that. So you're starting to think like who could have moved Barton without him realizing and who could have killed Tony in a microscopic way. And then once you start going like, Oh, there was something in his bloodstream. And then I was like, and who's smart enough to kill the Hulk? Cause you know, as far as everyone's aware, I was concerned that he's immortal. 
and everyone just keeps coming at him with guns and bullets. So, like that's gonna do anything. And Hank he just he just like, blew him up using his little thing, which isn't meant to be used that way. And grew his yeah, and you. Re- and just, and Michael Douglas does such, such a great job as a truly insane version of this character. This guy has just been driven by grief to the furthest reaches of his humanity. It's a really good episode. Almost as good as my favorite episode, episode four, What If? Doctor Strange Lost His Heart Instead of His Hands. In a slightly desperate attempt to make us care about the character Christine Palmer, played by Rachel McAdams... <laughs> No one cared. She was fine. Richard Adams did a good job, but no one cared. Um, she could have been cut out. It would have been fine. Uh, basically, Stephen Strange actually takes her with him in his fated car crash to the place where they were going. Symposium, lecture, whatever. And he ends up living, but she ends up dying. And so that's what convinces him to study the mystic arts. But that's not the big... Well, it is kind of the big, but it's not the huge, one of the most pivotal what-if moments in the episode. One bit comes later on, after the events of the first Doctor Strange movie, where he's sitting alone at Sanctum Sanctorum, and she's like, oh, I'm really happy that I've got these magic powers, my hands are all fine, but I miss my girlfriend. And then he's just like, maybe I could save her. That's the what-if. It's not her dying, it's this moment. This is the linchpin much which the whole episode revolves. He then studies forbidden law, forbidden magic, all sorts of things. Just just go back in time and try and save her. And what I like about it is it's a slow burn. Y- you don't immediately see, like you think at some point, like, okay, he's trying some stuff and it's just clearly not going to work, but he can bring himself out of this. Oh, he's driving into even more forbidden magics. But, you know, he's going to use them responsibly. Oh, he's looking a little bit weird. He's like absorbing the power of magical eldritch abominations from beyond the veil of time and space. The the is octopus he... monster from Captain Carter comes back, which is a yeah. great addition, and kicks his ass <laughs> for a little bit. And you see him growing darker and darker, but also like he's made built a relationship with this guy's helping it out with um, what's his name? Oh my god, I'm trying to remember. Uh, Obeng. Obeng. Obeng is a great addition. I just want to say that. I, I love his stoic, because, you know, this is this is back in time. Dr. Strange actually went back in time to the Labyrinth of Cagliostro, and who, you know, if you remember the name, it's the Eye of Cagliostro is what, you know, houses the the time stone. I thought that was the Eye of Agamotto. Agamo- yeah, sorry. Uh, Cagliostro is somebody, but, but he goes back to, like, this older, like, wizard and he wants to find out all the secrets and everything and this Obang never fully admonishes him he never says oh what you're doing is wrong he just says you're probably going to regret this and he just he leads by example he shows his wisdom when he you know dies of old age because Doctor Strange has been keeping himself alive and time traveling and fucking with himself so much he's outlived him and Doctor Strange just like is it would have been so stupid if it was like I don't care about you, Obeng. I've outgrown you. But no, it's just like oh no, Obey, Maybe I can help you. And he's just like no, don't, don't fuck with the natural order, Stephen. This is what's meant to happen. I I like that he's a friend and he's a mentor and he's someone who's been there and he's lost as well. But he's trying to tell Stephen like you can be better than this. You don't have to do this. You don't have to be. Uh, negative, like you don't have to become what you're becoming. You're so obsessed with death, you've forgotten how to live. It's it, it's beautiful story, and Bennett Cumberbatch is a fucking amazing work, work with his voice acting in this. He's voice acted in a couple of other things. He's been okay, less so in The Grinch. Just saying, <laughs> wasn't even the worst part of that movie. But anyway, uh, <laughs> and you think like, okay, is he going to bring himself out of this? Is he going to bring himself out of this? No. And in the end, the Ancient One has to go back to the point where he decided to uh, do it. But actually, there's a point where he says, no, you know what? I'm going to move on with my life. And she takes that version of Stephen Strange. And it's like, okay, evil version of you. You got to go fight them. And you think, okay, good Strange is going to win. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. It does not pay off for them. Bad Strange. Loser. I say bad, strange, because he's not objectively evil. He's just so 
obsessed with winning, except he doesn't realize what he's doing because his fucking up of the magical arts and the natural order things is causing the destabilization of the multiverse. And the Watcher is not happy about this. And it gets to the point where he actually does manage to save Christine. Finally! Hooray! He's finally done it! And the multiverse, and was well, the universe rather, is collapsing around him. And he tries to use his magical power to save him. But here's the thing. Only the episode, he heard the Watcher's narration. And he turned around like, who's there? Because the Watcher has been an unseen narrator for most of the characters. He's seen him like in the sky and you hear his narration, but none of the characters actually interact with him. They don't perceive him. So- Stephen briefly for a second heard him. He's like, what's that? And he's like, oh, oh shit. This is actually kind of a big deal. I'm glad they waited for the fourth episode for them to do this. I feel like they could have waited even longer, but it's so good. And then finally, the universe is collapsing on them and he sees the Watcher properly for the first time. And it's like, help me. And the Watcher's like, I can't. I was like, well, look, if if you save them, punish me, but save them. And the Watcher's like, you know what? If I could, I would. And the universe ends, and all that's left is a broken, remorseful, grief-stricken Stephen Strange, lost and alone in a pocket dimension of his own creation, alone for all time. Fuck me! <laughs> oh man, it was a, it was a great episode, and the animation in this one, like, oh, beautiful. Eh? When he's fighting the creatures and taking them and the final fight between good strange and i guess the i guess his name what people are calling is strange supreme which i kind of like yes between strange supreme which is bad strange and good strange is is fantastic the world is collapsing around them he's turning into creatures because he's basically a living he's got all hentai arms and stuff yeah he's (laughs) Oh my god, now I can't unimagine that. Thank you. I'm sorry, um, I've ruined that for you, haven't I? <laughs> sorry. Or made it better, you don't know. <laughs> um, Stop! He's already dead! But it's sorry. so good. Sorry. The animation is so good, and I think this is the episode that really takes it up a notch. Yeah, because then you realize, oh, this is a whole Marvel universe that has ended forever it's not really big consequence for the main marvel canon that's the whole point of what if but this could happen and it really speaks to the character of steven and the power Sorry, that he has up a for me. I don't know this is there. something that sh- i know it's also just got some great voice acting great life lessons about accepting the inevitable and not fucking with things and it's oh, really really good issues. and something that is slightly less good are advertisements here are a few of you now check them out and we're back. Okay, so next episode, episode five, what if zombies? <sighs> I mean, it's Marvel zombies. We've been watching this for ages. This was probably had the biggest reaction out of all of the things revealed in the initial trailers for the show. And it's one of the more fun and silly episodes. What? Yeah, it's, you know, don't get too attached, I think, is the biggest thing about this episode, is the characters don't really have too much of attachments, I I think, other than Peter and Evangeline and Lily, like, Peter and the Wasp have, like, this very sweet, like, brother-sister relationship, she's very caring towards him, and he's very, we never even seen him interact, really, in the movies, other than a one scene in Endgame, but, like, in here, they're friends, and they get along so well. But beyond that, nobody really talks, but it's zombie fighting fun. They go to the Grand Central Station. There's a great nod to uh, one of my favorite zombie movies, I Am Legend. Um, oh, yeah. I I thought that it was a solid... Even episode. though that's not meant to be a zombie thing, it's meant to be a vampire thing. <laughs> I'm just saying. They're like zombie vampires. <laughs> zombie vampires, whatever. Uh, although I will say... Um, Tom Holland does not make appearance in this as Spider-Man, which is slightly disappointing. I, though he's, in fairness, the character of Spider-Man is in very few episodes. I think this is the only one he's actually in, majorly, so maybe they just come back. Instead, he's played by Hudson Thames, a man who's named after two rivers. Oh my god, I never realised that. <laughs> <laughs> just, anyone else think that's weird? <laughs> it's, uh, hello, my name is Avon Yangtze. Uh, this, 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 this is my friend, um... Amazon 7. I don't know. I was going to say Amazon Nile. No, 
<laughs> then I was a delta. Ah, oh, damn. Does that count as a river? I don't know. Anyway, Amazon <laughs> <laughs> Amazon Nile. Amazon Nile is actually pretty good. That's like a 1940s detective. Hey, my name's Amazon Nile. I'm here to upload this case wide open. Anyway, um, so basically in this uh, this story, Hank Pym enters the quantum realm to get Janet. Does not go crazy, but it turns out she's been infected with a quantum virus. You can just add quantum to anything and make it sound okay, yeah. uh, which causes zombies. Uh, most people are zombies because uh, the Avengers tried to stop the zombies and immediately became zombies. Whoopsie daisies. This means that very few zombies are actually left. Well, non-zombies are actually left, including um, Hope Van Dyne, the Wasp, uh, technically uh, Ant-Man, Bruce Banner, uh, Black Panther, Vision, uh, Bucky... Uh, Happy Hogan, yay! Okoye, uh, Sharon Carter, Kurt, you know, from the Wombats, Spider-Man, and that's, that, no, that's basically it. Yeah. And basically, <laughs> this all happens because Bruce Banner is away from Earth at this point. He's been sent down to, uh, to Earth. Uh, because Thanos is coming, and then Ebony Moore and the other ones show up, and they're just like, "We're here to claim this planet in the name of Oh Shit and Zombies." <laughs> I I loved the the opening scene of that episode. Um, Bruce Banner yeah. just going, "Hey, Tony's here. What is to- why is Tony eating the, the little overkill guys?" <laughs> and just Doctor Strange and Tony just eating the the the, the Dark Order, the Black Order. It was fantastic. Yeah, and and the whole thing is basically it's Zombieland. It's fucking Zombieland, but instead of fucking Lex Luthor, it's Peter Parker instead. Here are your tips for surviving in the zombie apocalypse. I don't know. I can't do a good Spider Man, and it's him and Happy again. I like that Happy gets a chance to kick a bit more ass this because he's got the zapper thing. He he gets turned to a zombie though, and there's. <laughs> but I'm not going to give the whole thing. Let's just highlight some of the weirdest things. Happy using the Iron Man zapper. Before getting dragged off in the darkness, screaming "zap, zap, 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 pow!" The biggest thing I have to say, and to all the fans, if you weren't considering watching this episode, here's it. Do you remember before Endgame came out, and everyone was saying, "What if Scott just went up Thanos's butt and blew him up from the inside?" This happens in this episode. <laughs> the Wasp actually does the butt blow up technique, and guys. Come on, watch it. <laughs> That's not even the weirdest thing in the episode. Uh, they Basically, they're trying to get this one place where they think there might be a cure. They fight for a bunch of zombies. There's actually a bunch of references, I guess, incidental ones. You mentioned I Am Legend. There's also, I guess, Train to Busan, that uh, mm-hmm. Korean zombie movie, because they're on a train. I don't know if that's enough to cause a reference, but they're on a train. And... Uh, a bunch of them get killed and turned into zombies and they get there and it's like, hey, Vision, what's going on? Because Vision is there. And he's like, oh, yeah, I've been uh, working on some stuff, uh, trying to keep the zombies away. Oh, look, here's Paul Rudd's head. And he's a, a head like Futurama. <laughs> he's just a head. <laughs> he's just job. Paul Rudd as that man, as a head. I, I do want to say that. And he gets Doctor Strange's cloak. This episode did throw us for a loop because when the posters first came out, you saw Peter wearing the cloak. And people were like, oh, is this like a Peter becoming Doctor Strange thing? Because it does happen in the comics at one point. But it was a, yeah. it was a full fake out. It was just the cloak was trying to save Peter from the zombies at one point. And then Paul Rudd's head gets the cloak so he can fly in a jar, which is the silliest, stupidest thing. And it made me laugh so hard. <laughs> and they even then they do manage to throw in some, I think, slightly unnecessary serious moments. It turns out the Vision saved Black Panther, and the reason he did that was to keep him alive so he could feed him bit by bit to Wanda, who's become a zombie. Yeah, I I would say that my biggest gripe about the what if, and it's not necessarily something they could have fixed, is the runtime because it's only thirty minutes it makes it very hard for you to establish like real changing moments or like connections with like these characters in the moment. So things like the vision feeding Wanda and then immediately getting a pep talk and going, Oh, okay. Sorry. That was wrong with me. Okay. You guys can leave. Even though he's been feeding black Panther to her for like a month, 
Like, come on. Like... I'm sorry, everyone. My B. <laughs> sorry. They... Ooh, you suck. They won't attack me because I have an infinity stone. They don't like the mind stone. I guess that was the explanation yeah. is that they weren't a fan. But he managed to make a cure. Now he can feed more people to Wanda. A bunch of people die kind of unnecessarily. People sacrifice themselves really on a fucking whim in this episode. Bucky's just like, yeah, I'm just going with a gun. I'm probably going to die. I could stay with you. There's no real reason for me to go out there, but it will look cool. So, you know. Oh, the complete and indescribable anguish. Yeah, uh, but a bunch of them make it to Wakanda to work on a cure, uh, except at the end of the episode, it's revealed that Thanos is a zombie. Oopsie daisies. And honestly, just don't watch the episode. You don't really need us to describe it. Next episode, something I didn't see coming. What if Killmonger rescued Tony Stark? This episode is just like, okay, we got Michael B. Jordan. We're gonna fucking use him. Much more than Space Jam did. And so the whole episode is just like Killmonger utilizing his dream of whatever it was. Just take down Wakanda. The in- he wants to take down everybody. <laughs> Pretty much. He's just he's a rebel without a cause. Uh, what if he's just a tiny bit more successful? Because instead of teaming up with fucking Gollum, he teams up with Tony Stark. He rescues him in Afghanistan. He earns his trust, his confidence. And it's just cool to just see like uh, 35 minutes of 30 minutes of just Killmonger just betraying slash charming slash manipulating everything everyone around him with pure sociopathic ease i i love how charming he is in this and i think that's something that kind of gets dismissed a little bit in the movie in the black panther movie is that this guy is literally just out here just making people fall in love with him saying he gets- and there's a reason for, I, this is what pointed out to me recently and this is my privilege showing um this is a problem with a a, a lot of villains nowadays because studios are licking onto like what people don't like and they want to make villains that are associated with these things but here's the thing um killmonger's essential enemy is uh, the systemic oppression of black people in the u.s and around the world this sounds like a uniformly good thing oh he's against this thing we're all against this thing so we should be on the same side right but he's the villain so they have to make him a bastard even though his cause is just, even though we agree with everything he's saying, and he is 100% right in everything he's saying, whether it's in a museum, like saying like, this stuff is all stolen, or hey, there's a bunch of like gang violence because of due to systemic oppressions and inequalities within the system. So in order to make him an actual villain and not the real hero, they have to show him like shooting people in the back and killing people casually and just being sociopathic, even though everything else about his, his himself is just completely and utterly something we agree with. And that is, in many ways, a bit of an issue because it means ideology. I, on an ideological basis, we identify with the villain more than we do necessarily with the hero. Yeah. That's not to say the hero is a bad character or less important, but part of the reason why Killmonger was so big, was so was such, uh, such a well-received character, was because of that aspect but then Marvel have to go and make him a murderer. Yeah. And it's a little bit of a problem that I think they need to work on. I think a lot of us will be very happy to see a redeemed Killmonger, one who still keeps his values and his principles, but doesn't feel the urge to kill in order to get it. And and this, in many ways, this, uh, this episode continues that trend of him uh, just laying waste to anyone who gets in his way whilst manipulating everyone else that he can get to and it's really cool to see a character like that but then we're constantly reminded of like he wants to end systemic racial oppression yeah and in this one that's the thing he kind of at the end of it he kind of forgets about that because he just starts taking over wakanda too and it's just but in a very roundabout way because he kills T'Challa in the very beginning, which, hmm. which I will say that that that's there's a scene where he you know gets the herb and he becomes the black where uh, Killmonger becomes the Black Panther and he goes to the and instead of seeing his father like he did in the movie he sees T'Challa and that yeah. broke my heart <laughs> that that truly that truly tugged at my heartstrings because I was a huge Chadwick Boseman fan and 
having a scene where he's dead and speaking, why would you do this, cousin? I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> and oh, it was God. it was a bit emotional. But I, 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 I agree. I agree, Scott. I think that definitely, like, they, they try to make him a bastard, especially when he kills Tony. And Tony was really his only real friend in this universe. Yeah, but he never considered himself because... Oh, even though he's out there to liberate people, he has to be a bastard. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying you shouldn't have to make that change in the first place. Like, because, I mean, because that, again, that can work with some people, but it's the Magneto dichotomy, you know? He's out there for mutant, uh, picture himself as mutant, his mutant equality, and he wants, you know, savior, but he's his message has become warped somewhat but at the same time we can um sort of dissociate from our real world inequalities because he's talking about people that can shoot ray guns out of their eyes <laughs> so not actual ray guns rays of you know as so there's that there's that little bit dissociativeness but killmonger is actually talking about real people that really live in the world who are being crushed under systemic oppression so it hits a little too close to home for you to make him the bad guy. Yeah. I, again, I, I, again, this is something that I did not think of when I first saw the movie because of privilege and as, mu and as much as I am a part of that system, I have not been negatively impacted by that system. So I'm not going to see that straight away. Uh, this is something that I put, was pointed out to me recently. So it's, it's, it's something that they Marvel needs to be very careful not to do too much. In fact, I don't really even do it again. I get that this is a sort of a reaction to people saying that the Marvel villains were crap. So it's like, they're like, okay, we'll make them more nuanced, more subtle, more sympathetic. And that's good. Don't stop doing that. But just remember who people are really going to side with and then don't try and make the people they side with bastards for the sake of it. You know, it's... That's that's all I'm going to say about that, yeah. and it's uh, it's pretty good. It's it's a pretty good episode, and it's literally just about that. It's sort of almost very contained, and very insular in that way, uh, but it's definitely worth checking out. Next episode: What if Thor was an only child? Oh hi, thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage, but a fun piece of garbage. Love this one. I, I can't believe I'm going to say this after watching that whole season, but this is my favorite episode. <laughs> I, I mean, I get entirely why it is your favorite episode. It's definitely the silliest episode. Basically, Capers, the whole premise of the episode is Thor, uh, basic Loki was not adopted by Odin. And because of that, somehow this led to Thor being just a little bit more carefree and Loki actually being a lot nicer sure and this means that thor goes from planet to planet holding parties and this party threatens to destroy the world <laughs> no i'm not joking <laughs> that's a that's good party. the premise it's a great party if you ask me it's a great <laughs> and it's so good. <laughs> i i love this idea i i honestly thought that it was very because he never had to compete for the throne and he never had a brother who was actually because you know Loki was he ever really competing for the throne though because like that's not how monarchies work like he was always going to be king i guess just because odin had more time to spend with him but apparently he kind of disregarded loki a bit more i don't know how this works and frankly i don't care the one thing i don't know how it works is why in this universe, and somebody needs to answer me. If you have the answer, please comment it. But why does Loki look like a frost giant in this? Why does he look like an ice giant in this, but he doesn't when he grows up near Odin? He's still from the same place. Why does he look different? That's a very good question. <laughs> I can. Uh, that's something that really only got brought up in the first Thor movie, and then was since then, maybe it was like a one reference here and there uh, the but I, I can only assume I can only assume it's like magic that was put on him to make it conform to his guardian beauty standards I don't know I I I also I think talking about Loki him in this episode is hilarious he's so nice I think growing up near because he's king oh my dude Tom Hiddleston has a ball playing this character because he's also king he's the leader of the ice giants in this he's already gotten the throne so what is he competing for so he's chilling 
literally. What? Yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and yeah, and uh, just that's the whole episode. Like Natalie Portman comes up to him and tries to convince him not to have it. They have a one night stand. It's a whole thing. They get like magic and science tattoos. The whole episode is just silly. How the duck? How the duck turns up. Captain Marvel turns up, and she thought have a big duke it out. That in itself is also kind of funny. And then it's revealed that they call his mum away from a holiday, and so he has to convince the whole world to clean up the party mess before his mum arrives. I wish I was making this up. It was it was so well done, and and this is the episode where you get the most amount of cameos. I think you get everybody in this. Uh, I mean, Korg is geez. in it. Uh, you 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 look in the background and you can see everybody. Isn't Major part? players we see include Thor, Jane Foster, Loki, Darcy Lewis, Nick Fury, Jeff Bo- Goldblum as the Grand Master. I mentioned him before. Uh, Maria Hill, Phil Coulson, Frank Willow as Brock Runlow, Korg, Taika Waititi turns up for Korg, Nebula, Sif, How the Duck, Captain Marvel, uh, Topaz, you know, played by Rachel House, is like um, uh, the Grand Master's second in command. It's always cool to see her. Uh, Frigga, Hogan, Volstag, Drax, Fandral, Clancy Brown as Serta starts trying to make out with the Statue of Liberty. This is madness. It's utter madness. I love it. It was the it's biggest so... lunacy and the funniest thing. And his fight with uh, Captain Marvel, I thought it was fantastic too. I thought that was a great part of the episode. Where, where Captain Marvel basically goes, I can beat him, but I'm basically going to level of country if I try to. So what are we going to do about this? And I think this would make fanboys happy because I think a lot of people were in that discussion, like who's stronger in the MCU. And I think it was established it was Captain Marvel because let's not forget she put Thanos on his knees with a headbutt. But... I like that there's effort here. Like, Thor isn't a pushover. Like, Party Thor, who just spends his days throwing the best parties in the galaxy, is actually making Captain Marvel work for this fight. And I yeah. really... Because he enjoys it. He just likes the fight. It's it, it's he's, very, he's not even a dude, bro. He's just like, I like a challenge. He's living it's... his own personal Valhalla right now. He's drinking and partying and fighting and doing it all over again. <laughs> and he's just so positive like he's not toxic at all he's just a little bit irresponsible and chris hemsworth is just ha- again having a ball uh, thank god who whoever made the decision i don't know if it was him or like a or whoever to make him just a bit more of a fun character like he could still do the seriousness as we've seen in uh end game and infinity war but i mean kenneth brown has started his character off as such a not a humorless character, but he's very much leaning into the Shakespearean aspect of him. And since then, he's just become like, no, in in real life, bear in mind, this is like fantasy. It's not meant to be taken too seriously. But in real life, this Thor, he'd just be an absolute cuddle bug. He'd be, we, we like that sort of like himbo-ish, but still shouldering responsibility, uh, want to have fun kind of guy. And it fits into the character very well. And... <laughs> I tell thee, mortal, this party be off of the chain. It was, it's... it was so, and I, and I also love the. So Captain Marvel shows up because uh, Fury's out of commission because Korg runs him over. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm gonna have to actually stop this. Fury, my way. I, 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 I love Hello, how my name much, is Korg. I love how much restraint there is in Nick Fury calling Captain Marvel. It took him literally turning into Ash to do it, but in this, Maria Hill says, "Oh, there's a big party." I'm going to call Captain Marvel. <laughs> no, fuck it. Fuck it. I am not dealing with the cleanup on this. Brie, get your ass down here. Actually, it's not Brie Larson who's, who's, who's playing Captain Marvel in this, but still. Uh, Car- and Car- it's... Car- Carol. Carol. That's where it was. Carol Danvers, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, you, meant the, you meant the voice actress. I actually don't know who voices her. Uh, Alexandra Daniels. I'm not familiar with her, but it's not Brie Larson. That's what I mean. Uh, but there's one thing that is slightly interesting. Remember how we mentioned a couple of episodes? So sometimes it's a bit silly, but then it ends with a disturbing note. The same is here, because it ends with the watcher saying, "You know, I actually quite like this universe. Wait, what's going on?" And then suddenly, 
a version of Ultron with vision parts rocks up wearing all six Infinity Stones? And you might think, and we left the episode thinking, like, okay, so it's just a classic end stinger, like, oh, it's a different version of Ultron. Cool. Then we get the next episode. What if Ultron won? Ultron managed to finish his vision and incorporate that body into his design and basically killed everyone on the planet. Which... Iron Man kill count at this point is five. By the way. Iron Man gets the Kenny treatment so bad in this series. He doesn't survive a single episode <laughs> well, they, he's in. They wanted to avoid using the voice actor they got for him too much in case people realized, hey, that's not Robbie Downey Jr. <laughs> but nope, there's no one else on the planet. And uh, Ultron is just like, I don't want to live on this planet anymore. So he goes out and searches new planets to destroy. Because in his mind, I guess life is just too chaotic. So it's like, I'm going to kill it all because fuck Thanos and his half measures. Oh yeah, Thanos shows up and immediately gets chopped in half. He <laughs> uses the vision and Ultron uses the Mind Stone to fucking laser him in half like a fucking cartoon. Yes, and I'm just sitting here thinking, why didn't Vision do that in Infinity War? Because he got stabbed. <laughs> Like just point his head at him and say, "Laser him! Laser him now!" <laughs> and then, and then he just takes all the stones and he goes, "Oh, there's other life. Time to kill it." <laughs> and we just see that over the course of the time, we also that's interspersed with um, Clint Barton, Natasha Romanoff being like one of the only survivors on the whole planet, uh, trying to find a way to destabilize him using a virus version of Armin Zola. Which I cool, they got Toby Jones for that as well. And just try to stop him. Meanwhile, Ultron is just like going from plan to plan, destroying things. But he's eventually, he ascends to a high level of consciousness and he becomes aware of the Watcher. Wait, what? The Watcher's just like an actual character now? And then he breaks into like the Watcher's space between spaces hangout place and tries to kill him. And the it's Watcher a- actually puts up a fight. Yeah, because here's the thing. The Watchers are an insanely powerful race. They just don't use it. And... and uh, God, yeah. And and eventually, they met, uh, Clint and Natasha... Well, Clint dies. Oh, with the reverse of the whole endgame, letting go over the cliff sort of thing. Oh, <laughs> I'm not over it. Um, he dies, but they manage to uh, upload the virus, but it doesn't work because Ultron is outside of their universe. This leads into... The whole episode is basically one big setup for the final episode, episode nine. What if the Watcher broke his oath? Um, I'll tally that down as the 50 millionth time he's done that in Marvel. (laughs) Just saying. And basically, the Watcher... And I was like, what's going to happen here? Oh, I was not prepared for this. The Watcher goes back to all the previous episodes and nabs our favorite characters. He takes Strange Supreme, Captain Carter, Star Lord Chichala, Party Thor, Black Panther Killmonger, and a version of Gamora that we haven't actually seen before. Why didn't she get her own episode? That would have brought this episode up to 10. So they had to cut it because they couldn't finish it uh, because of COVID. Uh, at the time, So they had to cut it and it's going to be the first episode of the next season. People were wondering. Okay, well, okay, that may, I'm fine with that then. That, that, if that's the case, whatever. Okay, no worries. Um, we can get over that. But we and saw... basically, it's just like you are going to be my suicide squad. <laughs> oh no, that's a little bit. Uh, I feel like that's copyrighted somehow. You are going to be my thunderbolts. Ah, uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, no, no one cares about thunderbolts. Uh, you're the fucking Team America World Police. Who cares? Anyway. <laughs> You're going to be my uh, Immortals. Wait, that's coming out soon. Hang on. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but they became uh, the Guardians of the Multiverse. Guardians of the Multiverse, which is so cool. It's so cool. <laughs> and Killmonger, coming back to Killmonger, I really enjoyed. And T'Challa actually getting along with this Killmonger was really enjoyable to me because he robs people. And Killmonger is just like kind of proud that he's just robbing people. I, I love that idea that Kill, that. T'Challa's suggestion is, let's pickpocket Ultron. And T'Challa's like, oh, you're kind of (laughs) cool. And you see, we get, I like like how the episode builds up to the fight with Ultron. 
um, showing them all bonding, Party Thor and Captain Carter, and just reminding us about how much we love this show. And it, it, it culminates in Ultron sort of bringing the fight to them. Uh, Strange Supreme uh, conjures up a portal to the zombie world, including zombie Wanda. Fight doesn't last long. And the whole episode beyond that is just one big fight. Um, they bring this like stone crusher, this giant thing that's supposed to destroy the Infinity Stones, but it's from a different universe, so it can't destroy the stones in this universe. It's a whole thing, culminates in um, Apocalypse Black Widow shooting the um, Armin Zola. Vi- Armin Zola virus arrow into Ultron, so he creates a whole new body. Uh, which proves once for all that Hawkeye is pretty much useless because I like the character, I love the character, but if Black Widow can do what he can do pretty goddamn well in midair from a great distance, like, what do you bring to the table, Clint? Like, everyone, no, no, seriously, everyone complains about Black Widow. Oh, what could she do? She could just kick. Motherfucker, she's an expert marksman. Expert hand-to-hand combat, knows like 50 million languages, is an expert in stealth, assassination, espionage, and just generally kicks ass. And But you're not looking at the guy who shoots bow and arrows very well, but there's also another person on the team that can shoot bow and arrows very well. I'm just saying. I'm not saying I don't like the character. I'm just saying in terms of pure raw skill set, his toy should have done the least in terms of sales. Yeah. Just saying. Anyway. <laughs> Zola uh, takes over Ultron's body. Killmonger then tries to steal the Infinity Zones for himself because he's not been done uh, doing a lot in the episode. He's sort of been hanging back and looking at this like Ultron head, and he eventually uses like the narrowbots in it to make his own like Ultron up, pretty spiffy arm over the Infinity Stones. Just like, hey guys, I could use this to you know control, make everything better. And like, hey Peggy, don't you want to be back with your best friend again, your, your boy toy? She's like, no. And I'm sitting thinking like, you know what? Go ahead. Go ahead, Killmonger. Wish for something. Make something however you want. Because we all know that as soon as you use the finish stones, you're gonna fucking die. The only reason why Ultra didn't die is because he's a synthetic being. Like, it can't kill him. Yeah. You, y- y- like, you've got the suit and everything, but you're still flesh and blood. If you use the Infinity Stones, you're gonna get all fucking crispy burnt. <laughs> like... <laughs> Just let him do it. But anyway, uh, he ends up fighting with Zola in Ultron's body and Strange Supreme imprison them in their own pocket dimension. And his fate from now, which apparently he's pretty happy about, I guess, is just to watch over them for all time. Yeah, they're stuck in an endless loop of trying to take the Infinity Stones, uh, which I kind of liked. And it turns out that the Watcher, that was his plan all along. That's why he brought... That's why he brought uh, um, Killmonger in the first place. Because he really didn't wow. do much. And uh, Strange Supreme kind of asked him, like, this is what you... So you saw everything. And he's like, yeah, pretty much. Because <laughs> he sees through time as well as space. And, uh, yeah, so he turns all the rest of them to their expected universes. It's a really nice scene where they're all leaving. And it's quite bittersweet. We're talking about the hopes and the dreams and everything they've lost. And... Uh, in the end, Black Widow actually gets deposited not in her apocalyptic world, but in a world where their version of Black Widow died. She gets to pick up right where she left off. That was nice of him. It was the, it was the Hank Pym uh, world. Yes, yes, it was. That was a really nice callback because just like they're all just fighting Loki's people, and then suddenly she turns up, and he's like, "Oh no, this is much worse." <laughs> and she's so and- happy. And she kicks the shit out of him. <laughs> I guess all it took, like, like I'm saying, people dismiss her, but fucking she kicks ass. She's also a and, great team leader. Absolutely. And then the other sort of team leader, Captain Carter, ends up in a shield vault with her version of um, Black Widow to find a crate with a Hydra Stomper in it. And apparently someone's in there alive. <gasps> And then it's a really, really old Steve Rogers. No, not really. But we don't know who's in there. But it'll be interesting to see. So uh, that was it. That was nine episodes of pure adulterated awesomeness, heartbreak, and silliness. And I fucking loved every single second of it. Same. I, I thought it was great. It was so, so different than what we were used to. And 
I am really glad that they're kind of going in this direction with this and low key that, and even one division that they've opened up this like door of let's get fucking weird. Let's get weird. <laughs> And the best part of this, this is going to inspire different sort of stories. There have been rumors uh, that uh, they wanted to make it like a Star Lord to Charles spin off, but those uh, things have been put on hold due to Chang with Bozeman's sad death. Uh, Haley Atwell has said that she would love to do like a live action movie where she's Captain Carter. Uh, I don't, the problem is that would be non canon. And in terms of the mainstream Marvel stuff, I don't want to see. I would love to see a TV show about that, either live action or animated. So do something like that and i don't know if there's going to be a season two but i hope so that's why in the spoiler warning i mentioned season one because it could happen it could happen with the multiverse now open with doctor strange having the multiverse of madness and with loki opening the doors to the multiverse with i came to conquer sorry spoiler alert if you haven't seen it um it anything is up for grabs now and have you watched venom 2 no I, I don't think it's out in the UK yet. So. Oh, okay. Then I will not spoil it, but it, yeah. I imagine, I can only imagine this stuff going down in the episode. I don't even know if I'm going to do a review on it. I probably will do it at some point. Don't, but it's don't just... miss the after credits. That's all I can say. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> well, I, mean, I mean, don't get me anyway. wrong. I'm not a big fan of those movies. Sorry, uh, Tom Hardy. I think you could have done a lot better, but... It's not his fault. All the good stuff gets cut out from those from him. Tom Hardy he and Woody Harrelson best. could have done a so much better movie, and I think the Venoms yeah. kind of get like shafted. But the after credits, the game changer, and I definitely think that like Marvel's stepping forward is going to be something entirely different than it's been. Okay, I mean, uh, this is this is great. What I love is it's just that like it was so tempting for them to just try to like churn out the same stories over and over again, but they're using what they've created to tell new and interesting stories. And that's what I love about it. And what if is the purest expression of that pure unadulterated creativity featuring the Marvel multiverse. And it is a multiverse. That's what's great about the comics is there's so many uh, different variations and creative ways that they can express different characters. There's like 50 million different versions of Spider-Man. We can do different versions of these other characters. No, absolutely. And the cast is fantastic. Returning car- actors, brilliant. The actors that don't return, uh, but are replaced by dip- new actors, they're all great as well. And AC Bradley's done an amazing job uh, working on this show. She's uh, the head writer and executive producer on this show, and it's fucking brilliant. Brian Andrews directed, and it, the animation is just just beautiful and he directed all of the episodes think about that even the ones that feel quite different but it works really really well and honestly you're not going to like every single episode but you are going to like every single episode not all of them will be a favorite some of them you might want to return to again but you're never gonna have a bad time because this is just pure marvel joy and I loved every second of it. And on that note, I think we're going to end the show. Thank you very much, Francisco, for joining me today. It was my pleasure. I love talking about this show and I love being here. Excellent. And if you enjoy the show, Two Capers, please tell your friends. Shout it from the rooftops. And if you haven't already, go back and listen to other super episodes. Like the previous episodes we've done from Francisco. There's quite a few of them now. And you can listen to the show on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, or at podcapers.com. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe come to the show yourself, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AP2HYC. Thank you very much to Dan Harris for our logo, the lovely microphone, the red and blue 3D glasses. Those are mine. And thank you for listening. This has been... Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. Cue the music!